begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for Thy word. We thank Thee for these men that Thou didst raise up to hammer out these confessions from which we derive great benefit. And we take it that Thou didst ordain this from the foundation of the world. We thank Thee that Thou hast blessed us in such a way as this. Yea, even in our own language, which this confession was not originally written in, though it was translated into our language so that we might benefit therefrom which so that we pray that we would would do so by thy spirit cause us to understand and believe that we might be thy servants as we are by thy grace in the name of the lord jesus we pray amen we are on lord's day who knows <laughs> Lord's Day what? 13. Okay, Al's calling. I don't know, I must have lost him. I'm in Russ on hold. Okay, somebody save me from this predicament. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, is online. See, Cal, Al called me. I don't know what that was for, but uh, what do I do now? What do I do? Yeah, I got to do Armin again. Yeah. Okay, we got you. Were you disconnected? No, 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 just leave it whatever it is if it's working because it's messing everything up. Huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, Christy, let's see what's going on with that. How come I don't get anything? See, I don't know how to do Skype. So somebody has to help me. No, you got to just cut off first, then cut off. Shen先這個要先hand This is unbelievable. I this just broke. We are on Lord's Day 13. Question 33. Why is Christ called the only begotten Son of God since we are also, since we are also the children of God? Answer, because Christ alone is the eternal and natural Son of God, but we are children adopted of God by grace and for His sake. We look back at our... Of course, we remember... The Apostles' Creed is what we're going over. Last week, August, what did we deal with last week in the Apostles' Creed? Do you remember? Which statement? What do we have? How many statements did we have? Total? It was the second statement. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the first statement. The second statement, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Last week we dealt with Jesus Christ. This week, his only begotten Son, our Lord. That's what we're dealing with. So, why is Christ called the only begotten Son of God since we also are the children of God because Christ alone is the eternal and natural Son of God 
But we are children adopted of God by grace for his sake. And Christ is, now we're reading from page 181 in your book, about the middle of the page. Christ is the only begotten, the natural, proper, and eternal Son of God. But we are the sons of God, adopted of the Father by grace for the sake of Christ. And then down a little further, they are and are called sons who are, they, okay, so he's, now he's defining what is a son. They are and are called sons who are either born sons or are adopted as such. They are born sons who be, listen to this, listen to the insight of this statement. They are born sons who begin at one and the same time both to be and to be sons. August, what does that mean? You understand it? Chris, you got it? She's not there? They are born sons who begin. So he's distinguishing being a born son as opposed to an adopted son. They are born sons who begin at one and the same time both to be and to be sons. In other words, the moment of your existence, you are at the same time a son. Got that? Who begin at one and the same time both to be, both to be existent and to be a son. These are either born, these are either sons born from parents, which is to say those who begin at one and the same time both to be and to be sons. As soon as you're born, you're born a son of your parent, right? You exist, and at the same time of your existence, you have a father and mother. That's what he's talking about. These are either sons born from parents or through grace. Sons born from parents are properly called natural sons to whom the essence and nature of their parents is communicated. And that either, and that either wholly communicated or in part. Now, the essence and nature of our parents, of whom we were born, is communicated to us in part. But the divine essence is communicated from the Father to Christ wholly, completely, according to his divinity. And so, what is he trying to say? Christ was not partially God. He was wholly God. You, you, you do not wholly have the essence of your parents, but partially so, right? That's why you don't look exactly like your brother. August, you got that? Right? <laughs> or that's why you don't look exactly like your father. Breaking up a little? Can you hear? Okay, we said when we're born of our parents, we are at one and the same time, we exist and we are the sons of our parents at the same, at the moment of our existence, we are a son. However, what's the dis difference between you and Christ? You, par you partake of the essence of your parents, but it is not. You, you are not wholly your parents. Christ was wholly divine. Okay, down further. The next paragraph. They are sons by grace who at one and the same time begin to be and to be the sons of God. That they are sons, that they are sons results either from the grace of creation or from the grace of conception by the Holy Ghost and union with the Word. This is really interesting. The angels, speaking once again of sons by grace, he's not talking about Christ here, 
The angels and Adam before the fall are sons of God by the grace of creation. When did Adam become the son of God? All day. There you go. When did all the angels become sons of God? The moment they were created. At one and the same time, they began to be and to be sons of God. Because God created them that he might have them for sons. And that they, on the other hand, might acknowledge and praise him as their gracious father. Next page, 182. Second paragraph. They are adopted sons who do not be... They are adopt, Now, he's contrasting born sons with adopted sons. They are adopted sons who do not begin at one and the same time to be and to be sons, but who were already before they were adopted or who had an existence before their adoption as sons. John 8, 44. Read that, Calvin. When did we, when did we become the, the, the children of the devil? August. Yeah. When we were born, we became, right? We didn't become. We were at the moment of our existence owing to our being in Adam. The sons of the devil. And so that's what he's talking about here. They are adopted sons who do not begin at one and the same time to be and to be sons. But who were already before they were adopted or who, all, who you already existed before you were adopted but you didn't exist as a son before you were adopted. Or who had an existence before their adoption as sons. They have been made sons by law and the will of him who has adopted them and given them the right and title of sons so that they occupy the same place as if they were natural sons. So a person who's adopted, um, after he's adopted, what percentage of rights as a son does he have as compared with a naturally born son? Understand the question? Hell. I said, when a person, when a son is adopted, what percentage of the rights of a natural son does he have after his adoption? What? A hundred percent. That's what he's saying right here. So that they occupy the same place as if, as if they were natural sons. So Adam, after his fall, and all those who are regenerated are the adopted sons of God, received into favor with him on account of his natural son, Jesus Christ. All these were the children of wrath before they were adopted into the family and church of Christ. And so he's taking it for granted that Adam was indeed adopted subsequent to the fall. Next paragraph. Christ is also called the first begotten, Number one, according to his divinity in respect both to time and dignity. Secondly, according to his humanity in respect to dignity alone. And that on account of the miraculous and peculiar manner of his conception. And on account of the gifts by which he excels all others, angels, and men, speaking of the dignity. The first begotten. See? He's the one of a... In fact, that, that phrase or that word, I think it's a one word in, in the Greek. Uh, first begotten means one of a kind. So, according to his divinity in respect both to time and dignity, number two, according to his humanity, in respect to dignity alone. Next paragraph. Christ is also called God's own son. God's own son. Once again, in distinguishing him from us. 
What, I mean, what passage are we referring to specifically when we're talking about our being sons? Uh, Haldane, what's the first passage you think of? Haldane, you there? Yes, sir. What's the first passage you think of when you think of our being sons of God? Exactly. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, Christ is also called God's own, own son, because he was begotten and not adopted. Romans 8.32 Who spared not his own son, which distinguishes him from us. His own son, his one of a kind son. Further down the page, and the reason why he is not the adopted son of God in respect to his humanity, of course he's not the adopted son of God with respect to his divinity, but he says, the reason why Christ is not the adopted son of God in respect to his humanity is because he was not made a son of, a son of no son, but because in the very moment in which he began to be, he began to also to be a son. You see what he's saying? With respect to his humanity, as soon as he began to be a man, he was what? All this. As soon as Christ began to be a man, he was also at one and the same time what? The son of God with respect to his humanity. Okay, page 183. Toward the bottom. How then, it may be asked, are we the brethren of Christ? Okay, so, what's he saying here? If, if Christ is the Son of God, and we're sons of God, not only do we have a specific uh, relationship to God, which is Father to Son, but we also have a relationship to somebody else. Chris, who is that? Follow me? Right, and what is our relationship? <laughs> if 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 uh, if your father is August, if Randy is your father and he's also um, Hunter's father, then you have the same relationship to your father, but you also have a relationship to Hunter as brother. That's what he's talking about here. How then it may be asked: Are we the brethren of Christ? Since we're both the sons of God, we must be brethren. We reply that our brotherhood or fraternity with Christ consists in these four things. Number one, in the similitude and likeness of human nature and because we are born from Adam, the common father of all. What does he mean by that? All day, you got it? Right. We're both born from Adam, the common father of us all, with respect to our humanity. Number two, in what sense is Christ our brother? In his fraternal love toward us. Number three, in our conformity with Christ. In our conformity with Christ, which consists in perfect righteousness and blessedness. So we're conformed to Christ. He is our brother in the sense of what? What's he saying here? Armin. You got it? When a person is saved, what is imputed to him? Right. Perfect righteousness. We're perfectly conformed to Christ, objectively speaking. And so he's our brother. Fourthly, in the consummation of his benefits. 
we receive all of his benefits. Next page, 184. Of the divinity of Christ. All right. So, going back to, we can't forget where we're coming from and what we're talking about. We're talking about the Apostles' Creed. The second statement, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. We're still dealing with the concept of his only begotten Son. Christ was the Son of God in a way that is similar to our being sons of God and in a way that is to be distinguished from our being sons of God. And the way that it is distinguished from our being sons of God is Christ was God himself. He's the only begotten Son of God. He took he partook of the very essence of God. So now we're dealing with the divinity of Christ. And look at the four points under that. Well, look before the four points. Look at what it says right underneath of the divinity of Christ. This is fabulous. The doctrine concerning the only begotten Son of God is the foundation of our salvation and has been variously corrupted and opposed by heretics in different periods of the church. It is important, therefore, that we should here more fully explain and establish this doctrine. There are four things which are specially to be considered in relation to the divinity of Christ, the Son of God. So why is he spending time on this? He says, this is the foundation of our salvation. If Christ is not God, we have no salvation. Number one, whether Christ, beside his soul and body, is and has been a subsistent or a person. What's he talking about? When we speak of the divinity of Christ, we speak of Christ who was... Um, a person, a subsistent. Secondly, whether he is a person distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Third, we're going to go over each one of these points, so we'll explain them. We're not going to explain them now. Whether he be equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Fourthly, whether he be consubstantial, that is, of one and the same substance with both. In other words, he's saying this. If Christ is not a person... He is a God. Secondly, he must be distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Or else, he isn't Christ who is divine. Thirdly, he must be equal with the Father and Holy Ghost. Else, he's not God. If he's not equal to the Father and the Holy Ghost, he's not God. Fourthly, he must be, co he must be consubstantial of the same substance. Number one. On page 185, the Son of God, the Word, is and has been a subsistent or person before and beside the flesh which he assumed. What's he talking about here? He's talking about what we call the eternal sonship of Christ. What do we mean by that? August, can you hear me? The eternal sonship of Christ. That means, when did Christ become the Son of God? Of right. From eternity. He didn't become the Son of God. Did you, know, so, did you know some famous Reformed pastor denied that up until just a few years ago? John MacArthur. He believed that Christ became the Son of God when he was born. Unbelievable. The Son of God, the Word, is and has been a subsistent or person before and beside the flesh, which he assumed. Number one. To the first class belong those passages of Scripture which expressly teach and distinguish two natures in Christ and which affirm of the Word that he was made man. He was made man, but he wasn't made the Son of God. He was made man who was manifest in the flesh, assumed our nature, as the Word was made flesh. The Word, meaning the Son of God, was made flesh. He took of him the seed of Abraham. He didn't become the Son of God when he was made the seed of Abraham. 
God was man God was manifested in the flesh. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Jesus Christ was Jesus Christ before or at the same time he became man. Chris, you follow me? Was Jesus Christ Jesus Christ before he became man or only when he became man? Before. He was the eternal son of God. That's what they're trying to, uh, or science is trying to tell us. Okay, let's look way over to page 192. Secondly, that the Son is a person. How is Christ divine? Eternal Sonship. He didn't become the Son of God. He was eternally. He is eternally the Son of God. And so He is divine. Secondly, that the Son is a person. How is He divine? That the Son is a person really distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Why is that important? Calvin, you understand? Regarding the divinity of Christ, that Christ is God. He is a person distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. See the importance of that? Calvin, are you there? What he's saying is, that if Christ were not distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost, hold on, why don't you tell us? Why is that important? Because if Christ is not distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost, then what? Christ is not distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost, then we don't know what works. What, what is his work in salvation? All right, but even before you get there, if he's not distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost, then you remove the he. <laughs> right? Who are you talking about? You're talking about the Father with the Holy Ghost. Christ has disappeared. So, he must be, in order to be divine, the Trinity, triunity, the Father is God, the Spirit is God, and the Son is God. If he's not distinct from the Father and the Spirit, then he's not the Son, then he's not divine. That's what he's saying. Look further down, under number one, under this point. No one is a son of himself. But every son is of a father who is distinct from... You can't be your father and your son... You can't be a father and a son at the same time in the same relationship. No one is a son of himself, but every son is of a father who is distinct from him. Therefore, the word is the son of the father and not the father himself. Secondly, number two, the scriptures teach that there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, and the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The third point. Next paragraph. There are expressed testimonies of scripture which affirm that the Father is one, the Son is one, and the Holy Ghost is another. One, two, three. See, Father number one, Son number two, the Holy Ghost is number three. There is another that bear, beareth witness of me, Christ said. The Father speaketh from heaven. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. You see how that distinguishes? How is he distinguishes, distinguishing be, between him and the Father there, August? Otherwise, he would have said something like, my doctrine is mine and the Father's also because we're one and the same. No, my doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. The Son is distinguished from the Father. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. So Christ is distinguishing himself from the Father. See, one of the denials of the Trinity is called modalism. Al, you remember what that is? No, mode, M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M. -S 
It's so, well, they use an illustration of, of water. Sometimes water is a liquid, sometimes it's a solid, and sometimes it's, it's a gas, yeah. That's modalism. Sometimes, sometimes he was God, sometimes he was a father, sometimes he was a son, sometimes he was a spirit. But you see, that can be right, that confuses, that, so that's what he's distinguishing here. Number four, speaking once again that the, that the Son is distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. There are distinct attributes ascribed to the different persons of the God and the Father begat the Son, and the Son is begotten. The Father sent, and the Son is sent. It is not said of the Father that he was made flesh, but of the Son alone. See? an attribute which distinguishes the Son from the Father, that the Son was made flesh, the Father wasn't made flesh. All right, the third point, page 193, that the Son is equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost, without which, what? All they. Without which Christ would not be God. Right, there it is. How is it that we say that Christ was divine and Christ was God? He's equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost. So Christ, the scripture, excuse me, was Christ at one time said, the Father is greater than I. Was he denying his divinity? No. He never said the Father is better than I. The Father is greater than I. He was co-equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Number one underneath this. My... Well, he would, the Father was greater than the Son in the sense that he sent the Son and the Son obeyed the Father. Number one, by explicit testimonies from the Scriptures, this is the will of the Father that all men should honor the Son as they honor the Father. Well, if we're required to honor the Son as we, in the, as meaning what? August. Honor the Son as we honor the Father. As meaning what? In the same way. We honor Christ in the same way that we honor the Father, which means what? They're both God. Underneath that it says, As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son. To have life in himself. The same life. As the Father hath life in himself. So hath he given. Eternally speaking. So hath he given to the Son. To have life in himself. Christ is over all. Romans 5. Let's look at that verse. Romans 9 5. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all God blessed forever? Blessed forever. Number two. He is the true, proper, and natural Son of God. Speaking once again of his equality with the Father and the Holy Ghost. He is the true, proper, and natural Son of God, begotten from the essence of the Father. And if he is begotten from the essence of God, the same is therefore communicated to him. The same meaning that, that essence. The essence of the Father is communicated to him whole and entire, since the divine essence is infinite, indivisible. Look at the insight on this. How is it that we say that the entire essence uh, is communicated to Christ? Because you cannot, in, you cannot divide it. It is infinite. It isn't finite. And not to be. It is impossible that it can be communicated, therefore, in part. Number three. The scriptures that attribute all the essential properties of deity to the Son not less than to the Father, as that 
Number one, he's eternal. Before the hills was I brought forth. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning. Okay, what, what property is that? All day, the first one was what? First one was... He says, the scripture attributes all the essential properties of deity to the Son, not less than to the Father. The first one is what? Both are what? Eternal. Both are eternal. It has to be God. He's eternal. He never had no be any beginning. Secondly, he is immense. When's the last time you heard anybody talk about the immensity? Uh, <laughs> huh? You read these guys. These guys, the modern day Calvinists, they read guys like this and they're, they're not humbled by, the, by their reading, which means they don't understand what they're reading. What does he mean by that? Hold on, what would you say? Look further. He is immense. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. We are not immense because we are not, excuse me, we are not immense because we are, Chris, you see what he's saying? By immensity? What's that? Say that again. Well, he, well, he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Even, and then, see, ascending, ascending up to heaven, he that came down from heaven, but when he came down from heaven, where was he? He was on earth. But he was not only on earth, he was still in heaven. <laughs> that's what we mean. That's immensity. He's talking about his ubiquity. He's omnipresent. He's immense. There is no place that is not filled by him. Who can you attribute that to other than God? There is no place that is not filled with Christ. Then he says, He is omnipotent. What things the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. According to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. If Christ is able to subdue all things to himself, Armin, what does that tell you about Christ? Right. If he can only subdue partial things to himself, some things to himself, then he wouldn't be omnipotent. But since he is able to subdue all things to himself, he's omnipotent. He must be God. Next, he says, his wisdom is immense. What's he talking about there? Roman. His wisdom is immense. Are we wise? Al. Yes. Yeah. Who of God has made unto us? What's the first thing? Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We're wise, but what's the difference between us and, and Christ? Limited. Right. His wisdom is immense. It's talking about his omniscience. He must be God because he's omniscient. Who but God is omniscient? But Jesus did not commit himself. Look at that. Remember John 2. Jesus did not commit himself unto them and needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. He knew everything that was in man. He was omniscient. His wisdom is immense. Unlimited. Next. He is the sanctifier of the church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. What does R.C. Sproul say about sanctification? You guys remember? Oh, Randy? He says it's what? 
<laughs> I'm trying to think of the word he uses too. Uh, oh, he says sanctification is synergistic. He says uh, regeneration is monergistic, solely the work of God. But sanctification, oh no, 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 no. Sanctification is synergistic, meaning what? You depend on God to be sanctified, but he depends on you also. Hello. Where does the scripture say that you sanctify yourself? No, you're the sanctified E. Christ is the sanctified Er. And who can sanctify but God himself? Sproul says sanctification takes a lot of work. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Took a lot of work on the part of God. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He is unchangeable. Christ himself says, what? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That means they don't change. They're eternal. His word is eternal. He's unchangeable, and so he must be God. I hope we're deriving great comfort from this doctrine. The Son is equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost, the divinity of Christ, without which divinity we are yet in our sins. Number four, page 194. The Scriptures. in like manner, attribute all divine works equally to the Father and the Son. What did we say recently, again and again and again? God always does what He does in three persons. Same thing He's saying right here. The Scriptures, in like manner, attribute all divine works equally to the Father and the Son. So, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who was that? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. August. Who was it? Oh. All three of them. You better believe it. The scriptures in like manner attribute all divine works equally to the Father. And So how are you going to say Christ is not God? He created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created, whether in heaven or above or the earth or beneath, whether in thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were, he's talking about Christ. All things were created by him and for him. The scriptures attribute all divine works equally to the Father and the Son. He's the creator of all things, for it is said in the Gospel of John, all things were made by him. He is the preserver and governor of all things. Hebrews 1, 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. Talking about Christ. He preserves all things and he governs all things, as does the Father. Number 5 on page 195. In the scriptures, equal and common honor. Think about the... Think about the length at which he goes to hammer this point down that Christ is equal to the Father and the Spirit. Number five, in the scriptures, equal and common honor and worship are also attributed to the Father and the Son, which equality follows from an equality of essence and operations. You cannot honor the Son equally with the Father without giving him uh, without believing in his divinity. Christ is worshipped by the angels and the church. Let all the angels of God worship him. He himself said that all men should honor the Son even as they, in the same way that they honor the Father and so the divinity of Christ. All right. Page 196 at the top. This is the fourth point that he mentions back on page 184. 
whether he be consubstantial, that is, of one and the same substance with both. If he isn't consubstantial with the Father and the Spirit, he isn't divine. He isn't God. So back on one page, page 196, that the Son is consubstantial or of the same essence with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Down a few lines. But the Father, he says, but the Father and the Son are not only of similar, but of one and the same essence and are one God. For there is only one divine essence which is the same and is holy in every one of the persons of the Godhead. The Father is indeed one person and the Son is another person, but yet the Father is not one God and the Son another God. One God, three persons, but all partake of the same essence. If Christ did not partake of the same essence as the Father, he would not be God. What, what else do you notice in his uh, pointing out each one of these, uh, making each one of these points? It, it is all scripture. He's not coming up with this and then looking in the Bible to find support for his uh, namby-pamby ideas. Look at here. John says that there are three that bear record in heaven. They are three persons, but not three gods that bear witness. For these three, at one and the same time, there are three that bear record in heaven, and then what does it say? These three are one. The doctrine of the Trinity isn't that something that somebody thought up uh, uh, in a dream one day. It comes directly from Scripture. Next paragraph. Number one, because the Son is called Jehovah, who is only one essence. What do you say? The Lord our God. Remember when someone asked Christ, what is the greatest commandment? He prefaced what he said by saying this. The Lord our God is one God. Why is Christ consubstantial of the same essence with the Father and the Holy Ghost? Because the Son is called Jehovah who is only one essence. Number two. Why is he co-substantial, consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit? Number two, further down the page. Because he is called the true God who is but one. As it is said, this is the true God and eternal life, referring to Christ. Who is over all, what we just read in Romans 9, 5. Christ is over all God, blessed forever. Number three, because there is one and the same Spirit of the Father and the Son, proceeding from and proper unto both through whom the Father and the Son work. The Father works through the Spirit. The Son works through the Spirit. They are therefore not distinct in essence, but only in persons. Number four. Because Christ is the only begotten and proper Son of the Father, having His essence, see, that is that, is that which distinguishes Christ from us, though we were both sons. But as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, because Christ is the only begotten and proper Son of the Father, having his essence communicated to him, the same and entire, inasmuch as the Godhead can neither be multiplied nor divided. Phenomenal stuff. Okay, we proceed lastly to question 34. Wherefore callest thou him our Lord? And where do we find that? Once again in the second statement, back on page 117. Harmon, what is that? You got it? You got you guys got that book in, open in front of you, page one seventeen. All day. Yes or no? What? Okay, turn to page one seventeen. Armin, read the second sentence. Okay. 
What were we just dealing with? Norman. Right. Where is that found in that statement? Did Ursinus make it up? <laughs> so, you think this guy had a mind? We were dealing with his only begotten son. One of a kind son. We're the sons of God. We're not one of a kind sons. I'm the son of God. You are the Son of God in the same sense that I'm the Son of God, but in a different sense from which Christ is the Son of God, His only begotten Son. And now we're dealing with our Lord. You think our sinus saw something in this uh, Apostles' Creed, August? You think he saw one or two things in here? <laughs> one or two thousand. Now we get to question 34 on page 202. Wherefore callest thou him our Lord? Answer, because he has redeemed us, both soul and body, from all our sins, not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, and hath delivered us from all the power of the devil, and thus hath made us his own. What? Calvin. Made us his own what? What does it say? Made us his own property. Exposition. Two things here are to be considered. Number one, in what sense Christ is called Lord. Number two, for what causes and in how many ways is he our Lord. Number one. What do we mean in what sense? What do we mean when we say Christ is Lord? To be Lord is to have a right over something. I remember when we were kids. Remember Steve Estes? Steve Estes. What did Steve Estes, what did he want to change Lord to? You remember? He wanted to be, yeah. Big Bird, Oscar the Grouch. Huh? Want to get it down as low as he possibly can. But what's wrong with Lord? Huh? Nothing wrong with it. To be Lord is to have a right over some per thing or person. Christ, therefore, is our Lord and the Lord of all. Number one, because he has dominion over us and over all things. He has a care for all things, keeps and preserves all, and especially those who have been purchased and redeemed by his blood. I like that. He says he has a care for all things and keeps and preserves all, and especially those who have been purchased and redeemed by his blood. Number two, because all things, well, let's look at that. First Corinthians, what he just said, uh, especially those who have been purchased and redeemed. So if you buy something, after you buy it, Reynolds, who does it belong to? Huh? Say that again. Right. The one who buys it. If you buy a brand new car, you, you ought to see. I'm gonna have to put these uh, video, this, uh, these pictures up of these cars. Unbelievably, cars in, uh, in this small town in southern Taiwan. These cars cost a hundred to two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. These guys are driving around like they candy out of the candy shop. You buy one of those cars and you take a sledgehammer to it 10 minutes after you buy it. Who's going to stop you? August, anybody? If you buy a car and you pay for it in full, you don't even have to get comprehensive insurance on it. Because <laughs> right? you pay for it in full. You take a sledgehammer to it 10 minutes after you pay for it in full. Is anybody going to stop you? August, yes or no? Why? It belongs to you because you paid for it. That's what he's talking about. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. August, read that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Which ye have of God, and ye 
Ye are not your own based on what does Paul say? Randy. Yeah. In that sense, you're not your own because you've been and furthermore, the Christian the Christian doesn't want to be his own. Chris, what do we mean by that? Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> How about that one? You hear that? What's that? Did you did you know that was a song? That's a Kirsten. That's a Kirsten song sung by uh, what's her name Underwood. What's her first name? Mary. And Carrie Underwood. Jesus, take the wheel. Well, who gonna give it to him? <laughs> you gonna have to give it to him before he can take it. <laughs> We, hey, we don't want to take the wheel. You drive that thing into a ditch immediately. Page 203 at the top. The name Lord belongs to both natures of Christ. Listen to the insight on this. The name Lord belongs not only to his div uh, divine nature, but his human nature. The name Lord belongs to both natures of Christ, just as that of prophet, priest, and king. Further down, for both natures of Christ, will and secure. They will and secure our redemption. The human nature paid the price of our redemption by dying for us. What did we say? It had to be man who died because what? All day. Man sent, so man had to pay the penalty. The human nature paid the price of our redemption by dying for us and the divine gives and offers to the Father this price and applies it unto us by the Spirit. Okay. Number two. For what causes and in how many ways is he our Lord? Number one. By right of creation sustenance and government in its general character as well as that which he has in common with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Let's look at, excuse me, uh, Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2. Al, why don't you read that? Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. All right. Okay, you see, he's saying the exact same thing that our scientist is saying. Our scientist is saying the same thing that the psalmist David says in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him. He is the Lord of it based on what? Chris, what does he say? Based on what? Does he just say the earth is the Lord's period? He founded it and established it. Right. He created it. So it belongs to him. Created out of nothing. Think about that. Think of a person saying that he has free will. He is a created being. Come on, man. How can you How can the, the stream rise above its source? Impossible. By right of creation, sustenance, and government in its general character, as well as that which he has in common with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Hence it is said, All mine are thine, and thine are mine. The general dominion of Christ is that which extends itself not only to us, but to all men, even the wicked and the devils themselves, although not in the same respect. The general dominion of Christ. What does he mean by that? Harmon, you got it? General as opposed to what? Germany. Germany. General as opposed to what? 
Norman, you got it? All day. What is it? Specific. As opposed to specific. And so what does he mean by general? He says it right here. He has dominion over everything in general. And specifically, hey, we don't even have to look down the page. We know what he's talking about. What does he mean by specifically? Chris? Huh? With respect to his people. There we go. Because in under general, he says, even the wicked and the devils themselves, although not in the same respect. For number one, he created us to eternal life. But them, see, specifically is us. But to them, but them he created to destruction. Well, there goes your, uh, this is how ignorant reformed people are today. As soon as some uh, theological idiot gets up and says he opposes equal ultimacy. What is equal ultimacy? Chris, you remember what that is? Equal ultimacy. Sounds sophisticated. That boy, don't you love these intellectual Calvinists? All day. What does it mean? Equal ultimacy. We, well, you have to use the word ultimate in your answer. Otherwise, you don't answer the question. Equal ultimacy. It means this. The reason why anyone ends up in heaven as opposed to ending up in hell. Ultimately speaking. How about not ultimately speaking? Does a person go to heaven because he believes the gospel? August, yes or no? Yeah, yes, but not ultimately so. What's the ultimate, the final, the overarching reason why anyone ends up in heaven? What is it? Right, the will of God. Ultimately speaking, why are you sitting in, in, in Wellington rather than Fort Lauderdale right now? Why? Ultimately speaking, the will of God. Is there any, think about this, is there anything in the universe that isn't what it is right now? For any reason, ultimately speaking, other than the will of God. No. But those who deny equal ultimacy, they say, ultimately speaking, the reason why somebody goes to heaven as opposed to going to hell is the will of God. But when you're speaking about going to hell, no, 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 no. He goes to hell because of what? Randy, what do they say? Huh? The guys like R.C. Sproul denies equal ultimacy. He says he believes in double predestination, but he doesn't believe in equal ultimacy. He believes a person, he says, he believes a person goes to hell, excuse me, goes to heaven, ultimately speaking, because of the will of God. But a person doesn't go to hell, ultimately speaking, owing to the will of God, but owing to what? Because he did some bad stuff. Got it? So here's the secret to... He doesn't do exactly. Here's the secret to R.C. Pro. He does believe in equal ultimacy. He believes... And we're going to start with the second one and proceed to the first one. He believes, yes, ultimately speaking, a person goes to hell because of something bad that he did. And he also believes a person goes to hell... He goes to heaven because of something good that he did. You got it? You can't have, you can't be equal ultimate on one side. Ultimate on one side and non-ultimate on the other side. Yeah, exactly. So, he says, he created us to eternal life, but them to destruction. He created them to destruction. He has a right and power over the wicked and devils to make them do what he pleases so that without his will they cannot so much as move. Then further down he says, But besides this right, 
which he likewise has over us. He is also called our Lord because he guards us as his own. See, this is particular. First of all, generally speaking, his will overrules all of his creation, including the devils in hell. But specifically speaking, his people, his own peculiar people, whom he has purchased with his blood and sanctifies by his spirit. And furthermore, by this, his spirit, he rules and governs us and works in our hearts, faith and obedience. And so he's Lord by right of creation. Number two, by the right of redemption peculiar to himself because he alone, think about this, this is peculiar to the second person of the Trinity. He alone is the mediator who has redeemed us by his blood from sin and death. And so we call him Lord because of his redemption, not only because of creation. He owns us because he created us out of nothing. Secondly, he owns us because he, he bought us out of the slave market of sin. Romans 5.21 August, read that. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We just, uh, we can just uh, scratch out that last part. <laughs> by Jesus Christ our Lord. No, 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 no. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Reign, he's Lord, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But seeing that he has redeemed us, it is evident that we were slaves. Sin reigned over us. We were the slaves of sin. What does it mean to be a slave of sin? Calvin. What's that? Yeah, all you do is sin. But we have to keep in mind that a sinner isn't as bad as he can be. What? Say what? Huh? He can do nothing but sin. And somebody said, yeah, but you can sin. But, oh, but the sinner can choose which sin he... Hey, could Judas choose which sin he wanted to sin when the devil tempted him to betray Christ? Could he choose what sin he wanted to sin that day? August, what do you say? Hey, hey, what do you say? Get that ball and go. He wanted to get that ball. He couldn't go right to betraying Christ. No, he didn't have freedom even to choose the sin he wanted to commit. Think about that regarding total depravity. Haven't you heard that? Oh, the sinner has a, a freedom to choose what sin. No, he doesn't. We were indeed the servants and slaves of the devil from whose tyranny Christ has delivered us. Hence, we are now the servants of Christ. To page 204, number 3. By reason of our preservation, Christ is our Lord because he defends us even to the end and keeps us unto eternal life. Not only, this is the controlling power of Christ. He is Lord because he totally controls us. Because he defends us even to the end. And keeps us unto eternal life. Not only by preserving our bodies from injuries, but our souls also from sin. For our preservation must be understood not only concerning our first rescue from the power of the devil, but also concerning our continual preservation and the consummation of his benefits. So what's he saying there? All day. Number three. Saying that Christ is our Lord because he continually preserves us and ensures that we continue to keep God's law. I remember when I was in seminary and talking to this guy about uh, perseverance, which is what he's talking about here, preservation, perseverance. And I quoted to him uh, where Christ says in John 10, no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And guess what he said? But it doesn't say you can't jump out. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> That's the only thing you do is jump out. 
Yes, he preserves us. He defends us even to the end and keeps us unto eternal life. And number four. What's that? It removes everything. That's the that's the thinking of a, the non-thinking of a Baptist. It doesn't say you can't jump out. That's the very thing that it does say. Salvation is saving you from your state of being, your nature of jumping out, as the guy said. If ever it should come to pass that sheep of Christ should fall away, my feeble, fickle cell, alas, would fall a thousand times a day. So the question is, not... Have you fallen from salvation? If you believe that it is possible to be a, a Christian at breakfast and a non-Christian at lunch. Question is, that have, a, have, a you, have, a, have you fallen from your salvation? But how many times today have you fallen? If it weren't for the fact that Christ as Lord preserves us. Number four, in respect to ordination or appointment. Because the Father ordained the word or this person Christ to this, that he might through him accomplish all things in heaven and on earth. For Christ is our Lord, not only in that he preserves us, having rescued us from the power of the devil and made us the sons of God, but also because the Father has given us to him and has constituted him our prince, king, and head. So we have um, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. How did they become his people? All day. The Father gave them to Christ. And he is constituted. I love that word, huh? Great word, huh? Why don't you try using that one? The Father has constituted the Son to be head over the church and to be our Lord. Or if you want to talk like Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch, our boss. Yes, what a wonderful, I mean, what what what, what uh, wonderful things to contemplate. So, by way of review, the second statement in the Apostles' Creed and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He is God. He's the only begotten Son. But as many as received Him to them gave He power to become the sons of God. But Christ is a Son in a way that is different from our sonship because He is God Himself and He is Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another time together. In Thy Word, we thank Thee for these men that Thou didst raise up to pen not only the Heidelberg Catechism, but the Apostles' Creed, which is so jam-packed, full of meaning, and the ignorance of us even being regenerate persons and, and, and reading over the Apostles' Creed as we used to do, as I used to do, and thinking that there's basically nothing there but a bunch of uh, uh, superficial statements. How wonderful these confessions are. We pray that that thou would cause us to understand the scriptures so that we might derive more benefits from these uh, confessions which thou hast raised up thy servants to pen so that thy church might not apostatize. And we pray for the future of the church. We pray that thou would raise up men to stand for the truth and against the lie. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. We're 13 hours ahead of you guys. Yeah, and I'm uh, basically a zombie. I'm just getting uh, just when I'm just when I begin to get out of the jet lag, then I uh, 
then I have to stay up at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> okay, see you guys.